Hey everybody, Marshall here to share some really cool news with you. I, I trust at this point you've all heard about fake yeast. This is that Norwegian ale strain that can ferment cleanly at temperatures as high as, no joke, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 38 degrees Celsius. Absolutely crazy stuff. Well, last year, Imperial Yeast dropped A43 Loki, their Kvake strain, as a seasonal release, which meant we all had a pretty small window to get our hands on some. Not anymore. Imperial Yeast recently announced they're making A43 Loki a year-round strain due to popular demand. They're excited about it. I'm super excited about it. I've had some amazing beers fermented with Loki at terrifyingly warm temperatures. It is amazing stuff. Go grab some A43 Loki and see what all the fuss is about for yourself. One of the main goals when brewing IPA, whether of the clear West Coast or hazy New England type, is to impart as much desirable hoppy character as possible, and then to make sure that character sticks around for as long as possible. Over the years, brewers have come up with a bunch of clever methods for achieving this task, as well as some curious conjecture. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me to talk about the impact of purging the headspace of kegged IPA is contributor Brian Hall. You know, Marshall, a lot of brewers that go after those hugely hopped IPAs feel like after they put in a lot of effort with a single flick of a PRV valve, they can be (laughs) releasing all of that back into the atmosphere. Today, we're going to talk about an experiment we did on that and just kind of go over some of the things that go along with the idea of um, those volatile hop aromas leaving. Right. Leaving the keg that you that you put the beer into. Uh, it's funny. Bre- brewers seem to come up with new things to be afraid of on a seemingly daily basis. I mean, this is something for anyone who's been around, I- at least home brewing for any amount of time, you definitely know what I'm talking about. Uh, but this is one of those things that I've known about ever since I started kegging my beer back in 2011. So it's been around for a while and I definitely uh, bought into it for a while. You know, I, I that doesn't necessarily mean I, I didn't ever purge my kegs, but I did kind of presume that I was losing something by doing that. We're going to be getting into the process of purging keg headspace and discussing the results of a fascinating experiment on the topic as well. Well, we made it to 2020 without incident. Happy New Year to all of our listeners. We've got some really great stuff planned for the year uh, that we're going to be sure to share here on the show as it happens. Uh, I want to yet again thank all of our patrons out there, those people who have made the conscious decision to support us over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, uh, where they also get in return a nice little reward every Every month for their support. Uh, rewards include things like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with someone in the brewing world. Our guest for January from Fifth Hammer Brewing out of Queens, New York, is Mary Izette, whose name you may also recognize as the author of Speed Brewing, Techniques and Recipes for Fast Fermenting Beers, Ciders, Meads, and more. Uh, past guests have included folks like John Kimmich from The Alchemist, Gordon Strong, Lars Maria Scarshall, and so many more and all past sessions are available on our private Facebook page so you can watch them whenever you want. Uh, learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and a review in Apple Podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we would really appreciate it. Feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high quality quality stainless fittings at great prices with super fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com and don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. Again, that's brewershardware.com. Listener Brian Newcomb had some feedback on something he heard, I think me say, uh, in a past episode. He wrote, uh, being a celiac, I got into home brewing because I was bored with the limited options for gluten-free beer in my area. I want to address something I heard in an episode recently about Clarity Firm reducing the gluten content of barley-based beers. As you know, Clarity Firm breaks protein proteins down to create clear beer, including gluten. This is supposed to reduce the gluten content to a low level, uh, which is supposedly okay for celiacs. However, there's no reliable way to measure the gluten content of fermented foods or beverages using the uh, ELISA test, I believe. It's all caps, E-L-I-S-A. He says, additionally, the enzymes only break the gluten into uh, gladians and peptides of gluten, which still trigger the autoimmune response in celiacs with or without recognizable symptoms. A recent study by the Gluten Intolerance Group concluded that the gluten-reduced beer is not safe for celiacs. The TTB requires that any barley beer treated to reduce gluten be labeled gluten-reduced or crafted to remove slash reduce gluten and not gluten-free. Any beer labeled gluten-free must be brewed from all naturally gluten-free ingredients. Brian, what do you think, man? 
Sounds like an appropriate response. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about gluten free beer. The uh, the closest I've been is having to make a gluten free pizza one time, but I've never uh, <laughs> never done that other unless you count meat or cider. But I mean, it makes sense. That's a that's a condition that you don't want to mess around with. Yeah. The reason I I wanted to bring this one up and why I'm sharing this is because I believe it was me who mentioned something about Clarity Firm reducing gluten to the point where I gluten intolerant people at least could drink it without issue. Um, what Brian here is saying apparently is that officially uh, Clarity Firm is not necessarily reducing the gluten enough for people with diagnosed with celiacs to be safe. Um, it sounds like maybe they could get away with drinking a beer from you know time to time, but that, that there's no good way to measure the amount of gluten left over. Uh, we did an experiment a while back, one that I brewed where, and we should probably do a show on this one, uh, where I actually compared Clarity Firm to no fining at all and then we did a uh, gluten test. Uh, I had a company send me a food gluten test kit, and neither of those beers returned uh, uh, signs of gluten in the beer, which you could take one of two ways. One, neither of them had gluten, but I highly, highly doubt that. One could also be that the test just didn't work properly. And after reading what Brian said, I guess I'm just concerned that perhaps uh, because there aren't good tests out there using this ELISA test, uh, apparently, uh, you might want to be careful if you are gluten intolerant. So Brian, thank you so much for the feedback. He also uh, left some really good resources here for folks who might be uh, gluten intolerant or celiacs. He said uh, that glutenfreehomebrewing.com, first off, they sell gluten uh, free ingredients for brewers, as well as a Facebook group. And I, I think I'm reading this correctly called gluten free beer, great taste, less diarrhea. So if you're, if you're gluten <laughs> intolerant, they've got a sense you, of humor at the very least. You had me at less diarrhea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again for the feedback, Brian. Uh, if you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. I don't drink much mead. It's not something I'm necessarily against. I just don't really find myself sipping on it very often. I tend to like lower alcohol stuff, but I do enjoy occasionally tasting the creations that others make. Uh, folks like Mark and Poppy Pellicle, who sent me a Melamel they made using wildflower honey and blueberries, then aging it on rum-soaked hickory chips before dosing it in the bottle with a tincture of fenugreek and whiskey. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Grape juice for the win. It does look like some grape juice. Or Motorola. Oh, man. It's a good aroma. Ooh. We're drinking wine. It's thick. Very viscous. God, this is good. Oh, that's thick. And delicious. Think honey. Of course. Honey! I taste grapes. It's good. I believe this is to be very strong. It's a mead. Of course it is. It's probably a Welsh's grape drink. It may be. And there may not actually be any alcohol in it. Do you smell any alcohol in it? Oh, yeah. Do you? I don't know what alcohol actually smells like. Yeah, I taste a little bit of alcohol. Yeah, it's strong. If it, it is it Welsh's, strong. if it is Welsh's grape juice, he poured some vodka in there. It actually just tastes like a good wine. Yeah, except that a real sweet wine, whatever kind of wine that is. I'm not a wine drinker. I like it. It's delicious. It's good. It almost tastes like a mold, like a mold wine, but kind of like that sweet, thicker sweet. Yeah. yeah, I had a mold wine on the cobblestones of Europe not long ago, and that's what it reminds me of. It's very good. It's some kind of dark grapeish. Boozish, grape, grapeish booze. I would drink that by the fire in the company of friends or strangers. It's probably a 10 for me. Six, four, two, one, 10 jerseys. This Melamel was excellent, Brian. I can't speak highly enough of how good a quality this Melamel was. It was like breakfast in a bottle. My word, it was so good. I was actually surprised the guys didn't pick up the maple flavor from the fenugreek, um, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with the herb, smells very strongly of maple syrup. Uh, I, I learned about fenugreek. Actually, when my wife was nursing our kids, apparently it's an herb you can take to help you produce, well, women produce milk. And uh, yeah, fun fact, said milk also picks up nice maple character. Uh, hey, Brian, <laughs> have you ever used Fenugreek Creek in your, uh, in your mead making? I know you make more mead than I do. No, I've me I've used it in cooking, um, but I've never, and I've like chewed on it, but I never really picked up a very strong flavor from it. So when I read that, I was kind of like, huh, I wonder what that really tastes like. It, I mean, the title alone makes me want to try a sip. I would love to see if you can get a bottle shipped up here. Yeah, I, <laughs> Mark and Poppy, if you're listening to this, uh, Brian would like a bottle of your awesome Melamel. Uh, they I had will a pay really, shipping. Yeah, <laughs> they had a really neat name for it. I, I seem to have lost it, but um, uh, yeah, great, great mead. I mean, the or Melamel and uh, Jersey and Tim really seem to 
to enjoy it as well. Quite a bit, in fact. We finished that bottle off, and uh, you know we're we're all quite pleased with uh, the outcome of that that uh, mead. So thanks again for shipping it to us, Mark and Poppy. We've got another one we reviewed as well. If you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage, including melomels and ciders, uh, reviewed by Jersey and Tim, you can email me, Marshall at Brewlosophy and we will get you all set up. All right, when we come back, the impact of purging keg headspace. This episode is brought to you by Milwaukee-based Spike Brewing, designer and manufacturer of premium quality homebrewing equipment. Whether you're interested in upgrading to a stainless steel fermenter like the incredible Flex Plus or switching to a turnkey electric setup so you can brew inside and avoid the cold, wet winter, Spike Brewing has the solution for you. Visit spikebrewing.com slash brewlosophy today and let their team help you figure out what you need to make the most of your brew day. Again, that's spikebrewing.com slash brewlosophy. Spike Brewing. Pursue what's possible. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical Growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. Before I was actually kegging my own beer, I, like I imagine is the case for many people, spent a ton of time looking into various options as well as processes for kegging. And it was at this point that I became convinced, based on everything I was reading online, that it is absolutely imperative the headspace in a keg of hoppy beer especially not be purged for fear of releasing desirable hoppy characteristics just into the atmosphere. Uh, To start off, Brian, perhaps you can explain what exactly we mean by purging a keg's headspace. Well, when we're talking about purging a keg's headspace, what we mean is we have it under pressure with carbon dioxide gas, and we release it by using pulling on the PRV valve, or for those of you that don't have PRV valves, if you're using pin lock, there's a little um, apparatus you can put on the gas in, or a screwdriver works, or a tack, or whatever else you happen to have <laughs> around, and um, you release that headspace out for whatever reason it is that you want to purge that out. And and for most people, it's the if they've if they've put their beer into their keg without doing a full purge of the keg, which we can define here in a second, they have a little bit of oxygen in the top, inevitably. Yeah. Um, And so what they do is they think, okay, I'll fill this up with carbon dioxide, and then I will pull the PRV valve and release all the gas that's in there, let it pressurize with carbon dioxide again, release all the gas, and by doing that multiple times, the idea is you're replacing the oxygen that's in there with carbon dioxide. Right. This was that was the main reason when I first started kegging that I that I was convinced to do this. Uh, I'd read everywhere, you know, cold side oxidation, and we've learned even more so nowadays that it can be a pretty big deal, a pretty big killer of of, of good beer. Uh, And so when I first started kegging, all of the talk was about, you know, you fill your keg from the bottom up, of course, whether that whether you're going through the liquid outpost or just dropping a, uh, you know, some the the tubing down to the bottom of the keg. Uh, The common saying back then was that if you're filling from the bottom up, the CO2 that is in the beer will express itself and create a blanket, you know, to push the oxygen that's in the keg out. So you don't need a pre purge. We've since changed our mind on that. Um, and then once you put the lid on the keg, you go and you, you, you know, hit it with what 15 or 20 PSI of gas. You, you purge that off. So you vent the keg until it's not draining anymore. You put more in there. The idea being to displace as much of the oxygen as possible so that you don't have uh, concerns or your concerns about oxidizing the beer are lower hundred percent. When I first started kegging, the main reason I did it was that. 
Yeah, I did the exact same thing. And it, you know, you would smell your your beer as you purge each time. Oh, and yeah. with those hoppier beers, I mean there was there was a reason that everybody thought that you were losing such you know, you know, so much aroma is because every time you purge, it's like, wow, that smells really good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hopefully at least. Um, you know, the full purge that we discussed a second ago, just to just to clarify, is when we take a keg and we fill it up completely with a liquid. Usually it's a star sand solution, so that it's liquid to the brim, and then you push all of that liquid out mm-hmm. with the carbon dioxide so they're hypothetically or hopefully isn't any oxygen in there at all so that's what I, when i say full purge that's what i'm referring to right and i and i, I believe most of us uh, brew philosophy nowadays are doing that as a matter of course for the most part um just i'm it, doing it with all my hoppy beers yeah at, at the point. very least hoppy beers for me yeah. uh, the setup that i've got which people have heard me talk about in the past with the flex plus and all of that uh it just makes it so much easier to, to do that anyways i pr- i purge my kegs with naturally produced co2 and and yada yada so i'm doing it and it's it's even easier than what i was doing before there are a couple of other reasons people might purge a keg's headspace as well for me I exclusively carbonate using the burst carbonation method. Um, And so basically what that means is even with my beer racked into a completely, you know, uh, well, hypothetically, again, oxygen free package, the keg has been purged pre-filling. Once I get that keg into the keyser, I hit it with about 50 PSI of gas and leave it for 12 to 15 hours to carbonate overnight. Uh, then I come back and I have to relieve that pressure because if I didn't, it'd be it'd basically be like turning your water hose on full blast to have a sip of water. Uh, you know, it, it'd come out way too fast. So you got to release some of that pressure in order to serve at a proper, you know, at a proper uh, PSI. So that's another reason people people are, are purging nowadays. You don't have to do that. Uh, you can obviously just go the low and slow method. But again, I'm a burst carbonator. And so I do that. Um, am I losing you know, precious hop character by doing that. I, I, that's why we did the test, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, one other reason I could come up with why people might purge their keg is if they accidentally over carbonated their beer, which, uh, just as a PS or a <laughs> PSA, uh, ha- can happen pretty easily if you're burst carbonating at 50 PSI and you accidentally leave it a little too long. Um, you gotta, one of the easiest ways to, to get your, your carbonation dialed back down to where you want it is just to purge the keg, leave it alone. Don't put gas on it. Let that, CO2 express itself, purge it again. You might have to do it over 12, 12 to 15 hours, but eventually the carbonation will die back down. So, Right. I think other people, um, other reasons I can think of is people that want to use like a beer gun. It says lower the pressure down to five PSI. Oh, right. Um, before doing that, otherwise you end up with uh, foam bombs. And then, um, you know, there's there's been talk of people that use uh, kind of CO2 as a scrubbing tool for getting uh, off flavors out of their beer. So, you know, if you had a, a sul- I've heard sulfury flavors. Um, mm-hmm. There's one one other one that I totally forgot, but um, but using using carbon dioxide as a way to kind of like scrub out some of that off flavor and get some of those things out. Although, you know. We, our experiment didn't go that far, but then, I mean, if you're going to, if you're trying to scrub something out, I would, I would just think that at, at that point you might be getting into, okay, maybe you might be reducing some of the flavor, but for for this, for the purpose of today's show, what we're talking about primarily is the using the burst carbonation technique, or if you are not somebody that does a full purge of your keg and you decide to purge the headspace, that's, that's kind of what we're targeting at this point. It's not, we're not talking about scrubbing the beer completely. Right, right. Well, and the, and the common saying uh, for all of these, regardless of the reason you're purging it, uh, w- what I started to hear, you know, or read about really uh, online and in forums and whatnot was when you do that, if you smell hop aroma as you're doing that, that is now hop aroma that is no longer in the beer. Uh, you're, you're losing that. And one of the arguments that I heard, you know, and on some like really practical level, it sort of made sense to me is, is okay. So let's just say that the, the headspace contains a certain amount, right? It's saturated at some certain amount of hop oils or whatever else it might be, the stuff that smells good that you want in your beer. If you purge that, then it's going to, it's going to refill back up with more of that hoppy character that is in the beer, as opposed to, uh, that the beer maintaining some sort of a homeostatic, you know, level of those, of those hop characters. Right. But I think what, you know, when when we look at the instance of bringing it down from a burst carbonation standpoint or from, you know, or uh, trying to purge out the oxygen, we are doing a quick purge that's lasting, you know, maybe five or 10 seconds. It's going to take time for those um, 
aromatic compounds to come out of the beer because at this point you know they're they're in the beer so if we just quickly purge you know a, ha a quart's worth of a quart's worth of headspace um it's not like instantaneously those aromas come back out and fill it back up yeah to where within a tenth of a second when we're doing a quick you know sort of thing yeah yeah well and there's something so so as i was digging into this now brian you and i were talking about this before we started recording the show there is not a lot of scientific uh, literature on this specific Specific topic of purging keg headspace and what is actually in there, at least that I could find. Uh, you know, I tend to trust Scott Janish when it comes to the hoppy stuff. And, and I know you talked with him a little bit before we, we did this show and there's just not much stuff out there. So a lot of what we're relying on is conjecture, conjecture, and then also uh, just, just information based on other stuff that we are aware of when it comes to, uh, you know, hops in general. Uh, one of the things is the volatization of the oils that, or it, that, that are contained in hops. Um, and, and so it makes sense to me on, again, very practical level. You've got, uh, you know, hop stuff that's in the beer, all of these compounds and whatnot that you want to keep in there. And, uh, okay. So you're, you know, you purge off the headspace, that headspace then fills up with more really good smelling CO2. It makes sense. Okay. That's no longer in the beer. You're losing it, right? Is it enough to matter? I don't really know. But then I started wondering, we do know pretty, pretty well at, at what temperatures hop oils volatilize, volatilize at. And it seems to me if you're purging a keg, it's usually going to be in the keyser or a kegerator, nice and cold. Are, I mean, those hop oils aren't necessarily uh, uh, volatilizing off. So what is it? I mean, I, I, I again, we, I don't think we actually have the answer to this, but what is it that is creating that, causing that CO2 to smell so hoppy? I mean, something is, something's getting caught up in it, right? Right. I mean, I, I don't know what the technical term for any of this is, to be honest <laughs> with you, but I mean, it's the same thing as when you pour a glass of beer and you smell those, that aroma from um, that's coming out of the carbon dioxide as a, from the beer as you pour it. Uh, you know, there is some of that coming out, what it is and what temperature it exactly happens. I, I don't know exactly what those are. Um, I know, you know, they boil off at certain points. I think the the lowest boiling point of any of the hop oils is like 150 degrees or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was able to find, the, the closest thing I found is there was, um, there was a, a study done where different hop varieties that have different compounds for their flavors were, were looked at and there was one called 4-Mercapto-4-Methylpent-2-1 <laughs> that... <laughs> It comes from like popular varieties such as um, Citra, Eureka, Simcoe, and Apollo. Um, they did a study over a six-month period in, in different beers and found that temperature did play a role in in um, how much of those compounds were left. So, you know, th that's that's the closest thing I found to a data point. When I texted Scott, he said, "Yeah, I haven't seen anything in the the scholarly world." And I figure if Scott hasn't seen it at this point, it's probably probably not out there. Oh, ain't that the truth? Yeah. yeah. Which again, like, and like I said, this is, it leaves us to just kind of, uh, come up with some ideas. I, I, I guess a part of, a, a part of where I'm at is wondering where the hell these people who were touting on, uh, you know, internet forums 10 years ago, that if you keg, you don't purge cause you're going to lose that delectable hoppy character to the atmosphere. I, where did that come from? Because it doesn't, it probably comes from the fact that when you pull that PRV valve, you smell it right away and it just whatever room you're in you're two feet away you think ah oh, that's that's it all that's all of it coming out right there i'm sure that's what it is I mean, well but then the argument could also be made if it if it was coming out with the co2 then it wasn't technically in the beer which i mean if we're going to get into details you're pulling beer from the bottom of the keg so it, right. you know if you're if you're if you're venting a keg from the top that whatever that smelly goodness is on the top, you're not, it's not in the beer on the bottom of the keg. I mean, uh, so there was, you know, these well, are the things probably, that it's probably come out of the beer as the beer, you know, the beer is being agitated as it's being transferred. Sure. And that is one of the things that I found with well, kind of a side note here is when I was looking through all of this is, um, you know, some of the big guys at Sierra Nevada or Great Divide or whatever, the, some of those big guys were saying the agitation does tend to, um, Inc or increase the rate at which beers lose their hoppy flavors. Right. Because, you know, you're agitating some of that stuff out. So, I mean, you've got a beer that you've just agitated into a keg, um, you know, so it's probably released some, some of that aromas, and that's probably what you are purging out. Just guessing here, you know. Well, And I'm so guessing that people, people smelling that, it's the same thing that people, peop the same people that are, 
um, worried about losing hop aromatics as they biotransform supposedly <laughs> their hops and during fermentation. You know, they're like, oh, as I'm fermenting this beer, that my whole garage smells delicious. Yeah, I, was, I want that, that in the beer, right? Yeah, right. But and they're concerned about that. <laughs> Um, you know, I think similar, similar, similar ideas of danger there. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, so I thought about this on, on various different levels in trying to prepare for this episode and, um, you know, I, I, the, the, the professional commercial brewers that I know, um, they've, they, when they package their beer, they're not letting it sit on gas for two or three weeks to carbonate slow. Uh, they're they're doing what basically what we do and hitting a bright tank or whatever that with with a high amount of pressure to carbonate it up quickly and then getting it into a keg and doing all of that. I have to imagine there's some element of purging that's happening on on that scale, you know. And and um, maybe you know more, Brian. But but to me, if if that is indeed occurring um, and we're still getting these really great you know commercial IPAs that have tons of hop character, um, that would that would seem to send at least some message, you know. Yeah, I think I think from my limited brewery experience, um, the brewery that I worked at in Maine, they just you know there's a giant carbonation stone, mm -hmm. and so you can set it to a certain psi, and that carb stone will allow the CO2 to um, get in solution a lot quicker. I've I've got a couple setups on a few kegs that I have to where if I do want to have a fast carbonation without having to worry about um, dialing pressures or anything like that. I just plug it into a, a keg with a carb stone, put it in and it's ready within three or four hours. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, 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 I know that if you do over carbonate your beer in, in a big scale, yeah, it's a huge mess trying to off vent that sort of stuff. I was uh, working one day and they had over carbonated by, you know, like 50% or something like that. And it took, it took a lot longer actually to degas than it did to initially gas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is making me think of of potential future experiments that do seem, I think, on the surface maybe a little bit esoteric, and uh, but but ultimately really interesting. So, if we were to take uh, one keg, slow carbonate it, not purge it, you know, have it sit there for however many two weeks, three weeks, however long at twelve psi to, to fully carbonate, um, and then the other one hit with, uh, uh, you know, a, a thirty five psi purge it and then uh, give it a nice little swirl to t give it some agitation uh, purge that again you know hit it with more swirl it just to agitate it more the impact basically of agitation on uh, a scrubbing of potential hop characters I guess out of the out of the beer that would be kind of interesting right uh, the, the 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 part that gets again I get a little bit caught up when I start thinking about commercial examples of beer I guess in cans and bottles there's not necessarily any venting that's happening before that that beer gets into your hand as a consumer um, but you know with that when those those things are on trucks and whatnot getting you know shipped out to your local stores uh, I I would think that that agitation might have some sort of an impact as well. But then, then is all of that hop character just hanging out in the headspace, or does it get reabsorbed? I mean, there's so many questions I have about this. Yeah, I mean, the uh, Scott kind of said the same thing when you you know your idea of the uh, the continual purging. That's and what his comment to me was that if it's done completely venting off a keg continuously, then maybe some of the aromatics would start coming out and filling the headspace more and more. But his thought was that it's kind of trapped in the beer. Uh, I was poking around online. I found a, a discussion online where a pro brewer, pro brewer did run into this situation where they felt like their beer was losing its hop character much more rapidly than than it should have. And they actually end up having a gasket on a PRV that had a substantial leak into it. And huh. as they were continually pumping in more gas and other gas was going out, um, they were losing sin significant amounts of hop aroma. So that sort of <laughs> this is going to make me sound like a like a complete dork here, but that sort of makes sense to me. Uh, if you've got a continual flow, I'm assuming that they were using a carb stone or something. Uh, to, I would think so. Yeah, it's so a se seven barrel batch, a so seven probably. barrel batch carbonating on it, like a commercial carbonation method. Uh, if they're using a carb stone, then you've got that CO2 flowing through the entire beer, and then you know, so you've got gas going through the beer, picking up whatever it picks up, and then immediately being vented out of uh, whatever vessel that beer is in. That makes sense that it would actually leave. Uh, when I think about particular, you know, on the homebrew scale, purging a couple of kegs, uh, you know, uh, or a couple of times, a keg a couple of times, uh, because you, because you need to try to rid it of oxygen or, you know, reduce the gas after burst carbonating. That's a little bit different because that headspace is static for the most part until you start serving the beer, of course. But, but it, it's not, you know, you're not getting this flow through the beer and then automatically that, that, that gas with the, with the desirable compounds are, are leaving the beer or leaving the vessel. 
Yeah, I mean, I, the other note I had here just on agitation, um, and I don't know whether it has more to do with how long the beer sits on the truck versus whether it goes through transport. Um, you know, there's a, one of the the lead. I I forget his name. Uh, where's his name? His name is Tom Nielsen. He's the the lead guy at uh, Sierra Nevada in terms of hop degradation, and he was saying hmm. that. Um, he said, "We he said, and I quote, we found the hop aroma of a fresh ship beer overnighted from Boston. Okay, so this is overnighted. Overnighted from Boston compared to the same beer that just sat here in Chico is very much reduced. The degradation doesn't noticeably impact bitterness, but since aroma plays a significant role in your perception of taste, it can greatly influ- influence your overall enjoyment of the beer. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. So, and, and you know, it's totally uh, mental, th- or not a mental, it is kind of a mental thing with the idea of the beer being shipped. But I mean, we, we sat down, a um, couple guys and I, we back when New England's were really hot, as we sat down and did a bunch of New England IPA testing. And granted, there was some palate fatigue, but we did twenty three beers, I think, in the evening oh, and Lord. ranked them all. Ranked them all. Um, you know, once we'd kicked out all the yeast starters, and the, you know, four or five of the top ten, I think, is what it was, were local beers, beating out you know these ones that are ranked nationally. And people were people that travel around to. Uh, trial these were saying that you know it, it tastes very different having traveled so yeah yeah um, th- that is interesting and, i mean you know i also think it's really difficult we know or I, I i say we know in air quotes here because i don't want people to think we're being too certain or anything but there's really really strong evidence that particularly for hoppy beers uh that uh, that oxidation on the cold side uh, any exposure to oxygen is going to have a deleterious effect on hop character um i've experienced it i've done experiments uh, on it and and been able to show you know, replicate this idea it's really difficult for me to separate particularly when when it comes to packaged commercial beer that's been shipped to separate out, to parse out exactly what it would be that is causing the degradation of hop character. Cause it, for me, it's the, the, the character that I get in beers that I make at my house, uh, where I maybe don't take as much care to reduce oxidation or, you know, cold side oxidation, that character I taste in a lot of commercial hoppy beers that are maybe a little old or, or I don't, you know, I don't know their packaging processes, but potentially not packaged under good care. Um, so it'd be difficult for me to be like, oh yeah, that's because of carbonation. <laughs> you know, they purge somehow, purge the keg or where they were purging their uh, bright tanks or whatnot. Right. I think when it comes, you know, kind of coming full circle back to the purging, um, you know, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a huge, as big of an issue as people have made it out to be. Uh, we'll talk about the experiment in a second, but you know, we're kind of dabbling now into oxidation of beer and agitation and other things. And I do think those are all things that would warrant uh, some more study and whatnot. And I don't think anybody would argue with you that there's anything good to be had in a hoppy beer by having oxidation. Every Everything that you look into, you know, you've got these aroma compounds that are measured in parts per billion. Right. Um, you know, instead of parts per million, like, like bittering compounds. Um, you know, and if you, if you have these very delicate aromas and you're shaking this thing up or moving it, yeah, sure. That's going to happen. But you know, if we're talking about five gallons of beer and we're purging out a quart of, you know, gas that hasn't even really come to a full, uh, saturation point of aroma, you know, that to me doesn't necessarily mean that you're losing a whole lot. I will say this as you, as you were talking about that one thing that, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here going, well, it makes sense is on a commercial scale. If you're just flowing through a carb stone, through beer, uh, you know, gas through a beer, and then it's auto, it's immediately leaving that vessel that it makes sense. So on some level, I guess you could say that if somebody is purging a massive amount from their headspace, and, and I'm talking like, you know, but what, maybe 200, plus purges that I could see that potentially having an impact if they are using a carb stone or some other method of having the gas go through the, you know, start at the bottom of the keg and then flow up through the beer. So on, on that level, on an, you know, completely again, conjecture, this is just a uh, kind of a pragmatic way of thinking about it. It seems like it, that could potentially impact the beer. Uh, I, I'm again, I have no idea if it would or not, uh, but we were curious to figure this out. And that is why you, Brian, put it to the test. Results from that as soon as we return from this short break. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature 
in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. The brew in a bag method is blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code Code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. As we discussed earlier, there are various reasons one might purge or vent the headspace of a kegged beer. As someone who a burst carbonates at high pressure exclusively, I do it for every batch I make. Brian, you were curious how this might impact a hoppy beer and put it to the test. Yeah, so I decided to make a New England IPA because those are seen, seen as some of the most delicate beers out there in the beer world today. And so I thought I would brew up a recipe that I've really enjoyed, um, which is... 68% uh, mecha grade pale, 23% malted oats, and 9% uh, Vienna style. So I did a dual full volume brew in a bag, mashed at 155 or 68 Celsius for 60 minutes, combined the worts into a single kettle to homogenize them to keep any differences aside, boiled them for 60 minutes. I had a seven grams of magnum at 60 minutes, uh, 28 grams citra and five grams of, 20 gram, sorry, 28 grams of citra and enigma at five minutes, that's 20 grams of each, 43 grams each of citra and enigma at one minute. Um, after the boil, I chilled it as quickly as possible and then used a hydrometer measurement and found that I'd actually hit my gravity perfectly dead on at a nice 1062. Uh, I split the wort between two um, brew buckets, pitched a pouch of Imperial A38 juice into each, and fermented at 66 Fahrenheit, or that's 19 degrees Celsius. Uh, after 24 hours, I added 58, 57 grams of Citra and Enigma each as a dry hop. Uh, the beers were left alone for another week, took a hydrometer measurement. Uh, the F2 is a little higher than um, I had seen in some of the other beers, but it was still good at, at uh, 1016 for both. And this is that's something that I've seen in New England IPA in general is that the the finishing gravity tends to be or can be at least maybe a, just a tad higher than you might expect in a like a West Coast IPA or something like that. So yeah, I mean usually I'm around like ten, twelve, ten, fourteen. So right. I don't know, it's just yeah. a mental thing. Six seems like a big number. <laughs> uh, so the beers are racked under pressure to a sanitized and carbon dioxide purged kegs and then placed in my keyser. So now we enter the variable. So one they were both hit with CO two of equal PSI, um, but one of the kegs, I purged it for eight times. So I just pulled the PRV valve eight times, and each time I, you know, I didn't have an exact way of measuring, but I held it for about one to two seconds. Um, and then attaching the, uh, and then I just left the gas lines on the entire time and let them sit at, at uh, 15 PSI. You know, it smelled like hops as soon as I pulled that valve. <laughs> well, and great. That 
this is a really common method for people who aren't necessarily purging their kegs ahead of time uh, to, to reduce oxidation, cold side oxidation. Uh, I think Ray still does this method as opposed to pushing out uh, sanitizer, uh, the way, the way some of us do. Um, and so basically what he's doing is filling up his, a keg from the bottom up and then hits it multiple times with gas, uh, pulls that PRV or, or, you know, it depresses the, the pop it on his gas, uh, his, his gas disconnect and, uh, lets the, all of the air out, fills it up again, lets all of the, the air out. And the idea again, being that you're replacing all or most of the oxygen with CO2, which isn't going to have that negative impact on uh, on the beer. The the thing is, I think most people do this maybe four or five times max. You went overboard and did it eight times to really try to scrub as much of whatever it is that's coming out of the beer as possible. So, yeah, I mean, I tried to eliminate everything that was in the headspace as best I could. Just kind of just kind of take what most people do to remove oxygen and double it essentially. And so, you know, you figure if you've got, if you, if you were to hypothetically put your, your gas at one PSI, um, you know, the first time you per you purge out, you'd be removing half of the oxygen that's in there. You do it two times, you're removing a quarter of the oxygen. You do it eight times. That's a, uh, one 256th of the oxygen <laughs> is now remaining. And that's assuming that you're at one PSI. Well, we're up at 15 PSI and I'm sure somebody else with a calculator out there can figure out what percentage of the gas would be remaining, but it's not, it's not very much. Yeah. Um, you know, that being said, you know, there is, if we, if we take a brief hold at the, the purging of aromatics and just look at the oxygen side of things, that's still a fair amount of oxygen that you are leaving in contact with your beer when it comes to, um, you know, trying to preserve as much hopper on as, as possible. I, you know, I, it was 15 batches of New England IPA before I started doing the full keg purge and, you know, they didn't all suck. You know, I didn't have, they didn't go, pur we've had talked about this before and you'd love yeah. to remind me, it's like none of them went purple. So, you know, that's not to say that this is the only way, you know, that pur the full purge is the only way to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in terms of, in terms of aromatics, it's like, yeah, it smelled super hoppy and delicious, but you know, we, we, we ended up drinking the beers a couple weeks later. Um, I, I, I personally find that at least a week in the keg, if not two is like my, my perfect zone to drink this style of beer. They just come across a little green. Um, that's so, interesting because a lot of people I think are as soon as it's carbonated, drink the hell out of it because you want to preserve. But, but what you're saying, and I've, I've heard this from others as well, is that give it a little bit of time for that, whatever that green, you know, right. high hop character, uh, uh, is get to kind of balance out so that the beer actually tastes more, I guess, more fruity, more, more ju juicy, if you will. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I mean, yeah. and if you want a little bit of that greenness, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about mic micro dosing with, uh, different, um, you know, hops and fruits and that sort of thing with different beers. And I found that, you know, adding just a very small amount of hops, uh, directly into the keg can be a nice way to get a little bit of that boost without having the beer taste too green, mm -hmm. but that's, that's for another show. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they looked identical. I didn't see anything different. No, you know, surprise there. Um, I couldn't tell the difference between the beers at all. No surprise there. Um, in my mind, at least I think a lot of people might've been, been shocked, thought we lost a lot of aroma, but Anyhow, we, I served it to a bunch of different people. We had 16 participants uh, take the test, and I served it to everybody like straight straight off the keg there. Um, and we would expect that if it, if it was, if people were gonna reliably be able to tell a difference, nine people would have uh, responded correctly. And in, in this instance, only four did. So I think that goes to show that there was really, it was just a lot of guessing. Yeah, uh, I have a feel. I mean, four out of sixteen is exactly one third. Um, That's exactly one quarter. I mean, one quarter. I mean, even yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. My maths are a little off. It's you know the no, no. holiday. We're Somebody's gonna call holiday. you out. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. No. I, I actually wrote, wrote down next to in my notes here that it's twenty five percent, which is not one third, obviously. But uh, that is that is less than one third is what I meant to say. Uh, and it, you know, we we typically aim for a minimum of twenty participants. This was one where, given what you, you know your impressions, I mean, I remember you telling me these beers are identical. There's nothing different about them. Uh, I think for some people particularly maybe those who are a bit newer to kegging. It doesn't seem like the the anti-purge community is as strong as it used to be uh, back in the day. Um, uh, but, but you know, so th this may not be terribly surprising to, to again, to people who, who aren't concerned about that. As someone who kind of cut my chops back in the day of kegging when it was 
commonly talked about not to purge. I was really surprised, especially given you know you and and your your uh, how 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 often you're brewing these hoppy beers and how much you like them. I was convinced at least you would be able to tell a difference between them. But despite completely being aware of the variable, knowing everything about how these beers were treated, the fact they tasted identical to you said a lot to me. And then. Only twenty five percent of sixteen people. I mean, that is that's that's random guessing at at best. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I mean, it didn't surprise me just because I to me the idea that you're blasting out a significant amount of hop aroma when we look at all the different ways in which hops are handled um, from the time that they're picked to their packaging to how they're stored here at home. Um, to how we brew with them. The idea that I was going to blast off a significant noticeable amount of Roma with a quick several purges where in all, most likelihood after the first couple, I'm just replacing um, you know, the gas that was there with just more gas. I'm not scrubbing it away. Uh, didn't come as a surprise to me, especially when you know I also look back on the, all the different ways that I have packaged New England IPAs yeah. and they've all come out without you know totally sucking at least. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I it it's just it. I don't know. It's, it was kind of like, oh yeah, all right. That's kind of what I expected. Well, and, but, and you make an interesting point. You you this you did a uh, a type of of purging, if you will, th- that is very common for for home brewers, um, which is you fill the ke- you fill up your keg and then you purge multiple times to rid the headspace of, of of as much oxygen as possible, and then you let it sit there carbonate and you start drinking. Um, it would be again. I, I mentioned this in the last segment, but it would be interesting to see if there would be some sort of an impact of coming back and purging, you know, over the course of time after a little bit of agitation. This does not speak to that at all. This doesn't speak to the idea of scrubbing, you know, hop uh, characteristics from beer because of CO2 flowing through the beer and then leaving immediately, uh, leaving the vessel immediately. Uh, I'm still interested in that, but but I mean, based on this, and, and this may be, I mean, I, I know people can talk about what we do all they want and whatever, but this, this is some of the better evidence that you're going to find on purging a keg uh, around at this point in time. And to me, this speaks volumes. I mean, I, you know, no pun intended there, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good dad joke, right? But, um, you know, I'm not. I've I've been purging my kegs uh, at every batch that I make because I'm I've been burst carbonating. I'm not noticing any uh, decline in hop character. The few times that I do make hoppy beers, uh, and so to me, these results really do seem to kind of just validate the idea that it's probably nothing to to really worry about. Right, and I agree with you. I think I think with agitation and more purging or. Um, you know, a, a stone if you wanted to go to the scrubbing route. But, you know, I think all those things would be ways of removing more hop aroma, but I don't know of any of those ways that are, that currently at least um, align with methods that were, were that, are, that are traditionally, not traditionally, but are being used normally. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, you know, I don't know of anybody that's like randomly purging their kegs or agitating their kegs, that sort of thing. Exactly. So, I mean, there's there's lots of different ways to get hop aroma out of beers, I think. And I think that, you know, we've got, we've kind of got the main concern of, of, you know, when you get the hops, the package has got to be sealed. Otherwise you're doomed. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And then, you know, they got to be, they got to be in a full vacuum at minus 50 degrees. Otherwise you're doomed. And then, you know, you, you got to pull them out of the fridge, you know, a minute before your addition, otherwise, you you know, you're screwed. And if you put them in while you're fermenting, you're going to lose all the aroma there. You're going to, lose all the aroma here, you're gonna lose, you know, yeah. all these sorts of things. You better drink it right off the tap. If you bottle, you're screwed, you know, if you're gonna enter in a <laughs> yeah. competition, all these different things. But hoppy beers still taste delicious and hoppy despite all of that crap. Yeah. So it's one of those things where it's like, it is kind of, it's almost a relaxed, don't worry, have a homebrew sort of thing um, in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't seem like that big. Exactly. Uh, uh, the way I'm looking at it, and, and again, completely influenced by uh, your experience with these beers, my experience purging, and then the experiment results, uh, of all of the things that brewers worry about uh, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, uh, reducing hop character, particularly in very hoppy beers, 
I think purging the keg is probably maybe one of the lower ones on the list. Uh, It just doesn't seem to have that big of a deal. I think there are definitely other areas that our experiments and that a lot of people's anecdotal experiences have shown really do seem to have an impact. Mind, you you know, oxygen exposure on the cold side. Uh, Make sure, I I even think, you know, you think about Tom uh, Shellhammer's um, you know, hop, dry hop saturation point. Maybe you, maybe, you know, make sure you're you're hopping at what eight grams per liter of, of about. Um, and there are so many other things that you can focus on. What, and and you know, and then this 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 kegging or or purging the kegs headspace. It gets a little bit of attention, but I'm just not sure it's it's deserving of all of that. Right, because none of those other none of those other processes that you described that are all very important you know, blast you in the face, if you will, as much as having a big waft of aroma hitting you because it's, it's right there. It's hitting your senses right away. And for a new brewer, that could be scary. Yeah, no, no. And it, it, again, I, you know, we said it in the beginning, it makes a lot of sense why somebody would presume based on the fact that you're smelling hop aroma. Um, it, it's, you know, it's kind of funny for me because I, I remember reading, you, you know, you, you're new at something, you hit the forums and you start reading it and you're thinking, man, these guys have been doing it, you know, for two years, way longer than me. They're, they're the experts. But, you know, the, the, it really does seem like this one, uh, the, you know, the idea of, of losing hop character by purging the headspace in your keg was something that somebody just wrote out out there and and maybe said was true and, and without any evidence and I and I'm I'm comfortable saying that it's probably not nearly as big a deal as that person thought it was so yeah no I mean I, I'm right with you I was I was in my in my preform days I would just be like hmm that smells good let's go to the next <laughs> keg you know yeah it'd be really cool to be able to capture whatever that is and then like carbonated oh wait we're we're kind of messing <laughs> <with that. laughs> all right hey um we've got some reader comments I want to get to uh, this one actually yielded quite a few of people, uh, quite a few people asking us questions or, or, or proposing, you know, subsequent experiments on that. So I'm going to leave some of that out, but we got some good comments as well. The first one comes from uh, Kodak, who says, I'd love to know if they aged differently, if the two beers in this experiment age differently. Um, I found some super hoppy beers age pretty badly in the bottle and been told this may be, uh, maybe maybe due to not purging the bottles or using a beer gun. If not, then I guess there's something else in the process that's causing the premature aging. I don't really age any of my beers in the bottle. Um, so I can't really say I have an experience with that. As far as the beers themselves aging differently, I did my test. I, we kind of just drank them after all the tasters had gone through. Um, I wouldn't say that there was anything noticeable that jumped out at me as one versus the other. I mean, sometimes I will say when we finish an experiment, I will have a, a preference beer regardless of the significance of it or not. And that one will go faster. And, but in this case, um, I didn't notice any difference personally. Yeah. I, when I, when I read this question, um, to me, it seemed, I mean, there's, again, it's really hard for me to separate, uh, issues with aging or like, uh, you know, deteriorating hop character, uh, from, from oxygen potentially having an impact. If you are bottling a uh, beer or, you know, and you're not purging that bottle, it makes sense that, that oxygen is going to, at least you're exposing that beer to more oxygen than you would if it's just stayed in a keg. Um, so maybe that could be explain why, uh, you know, premature aging that, that Kodak is experiencing here. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, when I think about, uh, this concept that he's talking about with, with, um, uh, premature aging, I, I don't think that, that CO2, if the, the way that you purged, right. Um, it, you did the eight quick purges at kegging, put them in a keyser, and then you left them alone. Um, to, to me, as long as there's no oxygen coming in when you're purging the keg, which there shouldn't be because it's positive pressure, uh, I, I can't see that as having a an impact on that that perceived you know aged character or whatever you want to call it. Um, so so yeah, I I don't I don't think. I would. I, I know that you drink IPA pretty quick. I think most of us do. Um, I'm not aging many beers at all these days. I've got friends who like beer, so. Uh, but I. But I don't think that these would. I, I can't think of a good reason why these would have aged any differently, you know, than the other ones. No. So. But I, yeah, I agree with the with the beer. I mean, if you're using a beer gun and you're not bottle conditioning, you're you're ending up with some oxygen in there, and oxygen is the enemy of hops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a hop so. character at the very least. Yeah. Right. 
And, uh, and actually, yeah, we were talking about this in a recent episode uh, about what uh, the folks tell us when we go up to uh, harvest, how, how, you know, oxygen is bad, but really keeping those hops cold as, as, as cold as you possibly can seems to be the biggest protective factor, which I think is really interesting. But um, all right. Next comment comes from uh, someone who, who just put their name as the letter J. Uh, he says, every time you rack your beer, there's a certain amount of CO2 that comes out of suspension, thus purging the receiving vessel of all oxygen by the time it's full. That's why the results were inconclusive. Neither keg had any oxygen. I would say that the reason neither keg had any oxygen was probably due to the full purge beforehand or, <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but the idea that there is this magical blanket of CO2 that hovers above the beer as you are filling a keg is a, a, a nice story tale in my mind. I know there's people that, you know, they, they'll send you the videos of, of a gas that is much heavier than another gas. And yeah, there are some gases that are tremendously heavier than other gases. Absolutely. And you can get them to separate out if you want to do that. But you look at, um, you know, an oxygen molecule and carbon dioxide, and they're very similar. They have very similar weights. So if you've got some oxygen in there, sure, you're having some CO2 come out of solution. It's probably mixing with the oxygen because that's what gases do. Otherwise, we'd all be sitting here dead um and <laughs> as you're filling with the beer that you know you've got some liquid swirling around too which is going to cause that gas to move around so um my my particular vessel hopefully didn't have any oxygen if it did it was probably a very small amount because i did do the fur full full purge um but i would say that if you are filling that method that we talked about earlier where you're where you're not purging your keg out um you probably have some oxygen in there you're not there's no magical blanket that's raising with rising with your beer um, to push everything out. Sorry. Yeah. Will it? Okay, uh, th there's no denying the fact that as you're filling the keg, uh, gases, including oxygen and CO2, are getting pushed out of that keg as you fill it up. It, your beer is displacing those gases. That's how that works. Uh, oxygen is is definitely a, a bit lighter than carbon dioxide. We know that, but they're not so disparate that they don't mix. And this myth that people are so certain about that, I mean, and I, I know Jay was just typing on a keyboard and, and a, you know, not overly thinking this process, but this idea that the reason the results were inconclusive was because neither keg had oxygen. First off, that's not what we were testing. It's why you purge the kegs anyways. Uh, this wasn't a test of cold side oxidation. Uh, but at the same time, that, that this even if you hadn't purged it, I mean, you already said it yourself, but just a kind of drive the point home. There's definitely mixing that occurs when you're filling a keg from the bottom up. Uh, it's kind of been shown over and over to, to yeah, anyway. So we'll move on to the next comment. I just thought I'd, <laughs> something to, uh, for us to address. You know, the, the truth is, the reason I like to, to, to uh, you know, I included this comment and I typically will include comments like this is one, the idea of cold side oxidation has really gotten a lot of attention lately and I feel like it deserves that attention. So, you know, we, we will give it to it. Uh, but the other thing is there is a lot of this type of, you know, um, I, unequivocal sort of talking uh, that happens in home brewing. And I just want to make sure to, to, you know, point it out that, you know, unless you, unless there's a lot of testing that's done, you can't say with certainty that something is happening or not. And that that explains a result. Even we don't do that. In fact, we make it a point to try to explain ourselves as not doing that as often as we possibly can to the point we've beat that horse so dead. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, next comment comes from Sean. Uh, he says, There's, uh, there is unlikely to be many aroma compa compounds out of solution at that point. I think he's referring to in the keg when you're purging. Uh, he goes on to say, and when they are scrubbed from the beer, they stay out of solution anyway. Also, aroma scrubbing tends to happen when using a carb stone without adequate head pressure on the vessel to keep compounds in solution. This sounds a lot like what you were talking about before, Brian. We kind of went over this earlier when we talked about the idea of scrubbing versus what was happening in this keg. And yeah, I mean, we didn't we didn't really scrub anything. There wasn't continuous gas bubbling up through the through the beer. Yeah. Um, and you know, the beer the beer went in there. You know, it wasn't already carbonated, so there wasn't really a lot of off gas, and there's no real reason for a lot of aromatics to be coming out of the beer at yeah, that point. I think I think you make the best point there. Is this there's a difference between this concept of scrubbing? You you mentioned earlier about utilizing CO2 to intentionally scrub certain undesirable characteristics from beer. A good one that I've had experience with, and I believe you have as well, is sulfur. Uh, if you make a beer or a, or even a cider or something that just has too much of a sulfur character, you can actually agitate a little bit, purge that 
purge that keg headspace, do it again, agitate a little, purge it again. Um, and and, and it, you can effectively get rid of a lot of that sulfur character pretty quickly. Uh, it, it, I, again, I would imagine that if we did that uh, it, to a hoppy beer that perhaps maybe you, we would see a bigger di- a di- difference, you know, between a beer that was purged in such a way or scrubbed, if you will, uh, compared to one that wasn't. But that's not what this test was about. Uh, this test was just about the practice of purging headspace like a lot of homebrewers are doing. Um, and, it, and again, it showed that it didn't seem to have that big of an impact. So. All right. uh, Next comment comes from Brady Neal. He says, I love every one of these experiments. Thank you. Uh, Well, thank you, Brady. Uh, He goes on to say, I'm stealing the recipe. Just one quick question. Please tell me how you racked warm beer with a loose dry hop to purged kegs. When I try this, I get clogged lines and dip tubes. I use a hop basket or a stainless steel mesh canister with a maximum of two and a half, maybe three ounces of hops per container. So sometimes I will have two. That is the secret. Don't tell anybody else. Yeah, yeah. I, and I do the same thing. And I think a lot of, <laughs> a lot of us do. Yeah. It's, a, it's a funny question, though, because I've experienced exactly what he's talking about here. I, I was actually using a uh, the SS Brew Buckets, which I believe you used in this experiment. And... I, they come with a little dip tube, uh, that you can swivel around. And I, you know, I kind of guessed like, oh yeah, I'm going to dry hop this one loosely. I'll just set the dip tube at this point, kind of at a slight downward angle. I, that there was absolutely no way I was going to be able to, I had to, I had to pump CO2 up through the dip tube into the, into the vessel a few times to clear it. And oh, it was a mess. You can, you can just blow on it too. It works just fine. (laughs) I'll take your word for it. Don't do that, listeners of this show. Don't do what Brian is recommending. Uh, but but I, I I've it was because of that that I went and and your recommendation, Brian, to go and and buy these. Uh, they're like fourteen inch by I don't know three inch uh, stainless mesh tubes that yeah. work and, really well. Uh, for, for and you can get hopping. the ones on Alibaba are super cheap and they work just fine. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I found mine on, on Amazon. I think I got a pair of them for like 15 bucks or 16 bucks or something like yeah, that. So they're, they're, they're cheap and they work really well. I mean, I, I, in my experience, uh, and in fact, you, we will do a, 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 a show on this in the future. You did an experiment comparing uh, these stainless mesh screens versus uh, dry hopping loose. And it doesn't seem to really have much of an impact. I'm getting all the dry hop character out of my beers that I want to. So, um, all right. Final comment comes from Aaron Linder. He says, wow, your favorite NEIPA to date? Was it the hop combo or the more restrained hop usage or what specifically? Restrained hop usage? I didn't feel like this was that restrained. I, mean, I, guess, <laughs> I guess it's not crazy. I haven't, I, I really, I really want to pause right now and go back and look at the numbers to see if I hit that saturation point or not. But no, I find that, you know, if you're, if you're hopping too heavily, especially if you're not, I mean, if you're double dry hopping, I think you can get away with doing a little more um, in terms of hopping, especially if you're racking from your your fermenting vessel into your keg. Yeah. But I just found that if you're using too many hops, you're getting too much of a green character in your beer. Um, and you know this 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 beer didn't have the same like punch in the face as some other ones did, but it did have the most. I hate to use the word, but everybody loves it. Balance of um, New England IPAs that I've had, I did like a little touch of Vienna in there because I like a, I personally like a little more malt backbone in my New England IPAs than what you might find in almost every other commercial example out there. I tend those tend to be a little uh, a little thin on the malty side with the amount of uh, with the amount of hops that they're putting in there. Even though it is a restrained bitterness, but um, I really like the hop combination as well. This batch was also brewed at Anchorage Brewing Company. We did a forty barrel batch down there, um, and it was called Enigma. And it was the same recipe. The, it had the Vienna, it had the the malted oats, um, same hop dosage. I think he did double dry hop his though, but you know a pro system is very different than a than a homebrew system. Yeah. So I would say it was a combination of a combo of both the combo and um, not over hopping on the dry hop end. Right, right. I found, I found with some of these, sometimes less is more. And if you want a little more punch, that that kind of a keg microdose is a nice way to do it. Yeah. What, what I've never used Enigma, I, I, I'm selfish here. I'm not going to be making New England IPA, you know, anytime soon at this point, but I do want to try out Enigma. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that hop in general. I've, again, I've never, I don't think I've ever even smelled it. Um, I, it's, it, I think it provides, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, there's been so many batches, so if right, I screw right. this up, forgive me, don't take my word for it, but, um, 
I, if I remember, it's a light, there's a light floral characteristic to it as well. That's like, it's like a fruity floral. Um, so you still get kind of the, the same tropical fruits and that sort of thing, but you also get a little more of like the, um, yeah, floral, floral, not grassy, but just more of the, the greener side as opposed to just like the straight tropical fruit, more of like what you think of when you're like, oh, that tastes hoppy to me yeah. as opposed to um, that just tastes juicy to me. Right. So maybe so. more of that myrcene content, that myrcene yeah. uh, seems to be that, you know, people say that that's kind of the green hop character that you get. And um, I, I'm definitely interested to, to try Enigma. I'm, I don't even think we've done the Hop Chronicles on that one yet. So uh, something to something to look into. Well, that does bring us to the end of this episode. Is there any Anything else on purging keg headspace that you'd like to say before we wrap things up, Brian? No, I would just say that I would reemphasize don't fear um, purging your kegs if you need to do it for whatever reason, but yeah. um, you know, don't, don't overdo it as well. And also if you don't feel like purging because you'd still prefer to stick with the, uh, you know, the old adage that, that if you can smell it, then it's leaving the beer by all means, don't purge your beer. And don't forget to head over to brewlosophy.com to read up on the experiment discussed in this episode, as well as all of the other stuff we're up to. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man.